There is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. No other king. Father, we thank you that your presence is right here with us today. We thank you, God, that what we came for was you. And what we're going to receive this morning is you. We thank you, God, that regardless of what's going on, whatever's trying to occupy our mind right now, God, we just submit it to you. We say, God, in this moment, here and in the now, we are going to put you as head over all. We are going to make you the priority of everything, as you should always be. Father, I thank you that you have a special, specific, individual word for every person that is sending, sitting under the sound of my voice. I thank you, God, that nobody's going to leave here empty-handed, but instead they're going to leave here with their hearts full. Full of all that you have to offer. Because you can't help yourself but love us in such a way that everything changes. We thank you, God, as we lean forward into what you're doing in this moment, as we lean forward into your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Happy Easter, everybody. Amen. Come on, look at y'all looking good. Just give somebody on your right a high five. Just go ahead, just go for it. High five, do it. Oh, that wasn't strong enough. Go to your other side, give them a high five. Say, you made it to church and you look great. You guys are awesome. Thank you for being here with us at Redeem Life Church. My name is Pastor Anthony, and I, if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, I would love to meet you. Me and my wife mean that sincerely. So we'll be making ourselves available to you after church. I want to welcome those who are listening to us online to, for our online church. We're glad that you're here. And I especially want to welcome you if it's your first time here at Redeem Life Church. Can we just give it up for our first-time guests? In fact, if it's your first time here, we have a special gift for you. Who likes stuff that is free 99? Free 99? If it is your first time, I'm going to ask you to, to go ahead and raise your hand in the air because we have a special welcome packet for you. And if you know somebody's first time is here, but they're way too embarrassed to raise their hand, will you just go ahead and raise your hand for them and you can give one to you. And if you're like, I don't care what you say, Pastor, there is no way I'm going to raise my hand about anything, know that we actually have a first time guest packet for you out at the Infra Center. So on your way out, you can just say, I want to be incognito by him in one of them packets. And you can walk off with it. And inside that, it's just some more information about our church. We also have a free worship CD for you from one of our mission partners who's also an awesome worship leader. We just want to get that in your hand. It's our way of just saying, welcome to church. We're glad you're here. We hope you come back. And if there's anything that we can do to make your time here in my father's living room more comfortable, will you let us know? And that's what we feel about this place. You have gathered into my father's house. Welcome to his living room. If you need to kick your feet up, don't do it. Be right, no. Uh, but we do are, want to welcome you here, and we're just glad that you're here. Now, I don't know about you, but I love a good comeback story. I love them. Let me know if you've heard about this one. There, I don't know if you've heard about, there was a young teenage boy who recently moved to Southern California with his mom, and he didn't have any friends in the area, and lo and behold, he found himself being bullied by some neighborhood kids. And what made that bullying even worse is that this young teenage boy um, had the hots for the same girl that the head of that bully crew had hots for. Everybody say boo. boo. Made things a lot more difficult for this young man. So he found himself in a squabble, constantly beginning beat down and getting tore down by this group of bullies. But thankfully, unbeknownst to him, during one of his beatdowns, he saw an ordinary repairman come in and jump in and get involved and, and break up this fight. And what he did know is that this ordinary repairman happened to be a karate master. And when that ordinary repairman jumped in to break up the fight, he noticed that the bullies were using this karate form of martial arts that they learned from a neighborhood dojo. And so this unassuming repairman decided to take this young boy under his wing and teach him a more compassionate form of karate. 
And as this boy was learning these karate moves, first he was like kind of frustrated. He was just like, I don't even think I'm learning anything. All I'm doing is painting fences and waxing cars. <laughs> but the karate master soon signed up this young boy for the local karate tournament. He found himself face to face with his mortal enemies. He was afraid, but he knew that his, try, his, his training had all come to this point. So it's like those, one of those final tournament matches, and he's giving it all things he's gotten. You're like, oh, is he going to win? He's getting beat down, and then they play dirty, and they kick him in the leg. Ah! And we're like, this underdog is going down. All hope is lost. He can't come back. But then he searches deep inside him for some inner strength. And in that last moment, right, when you're about to count him off, he pulls out his signature move. <laughs> and he takes out his opponent, and the crowd goes nuts, and everybody is like, yes, it's inspiring. Talk about a comeback story. Did you hear about that one? Can anybody name that comeback story? The Karate Kid. Who doesn't love a comeback story? Wait, 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 wait. But I know you didn't hear about this one. There was this youngster who was being positioned to take over his father's organization. He didn't think much about it. In fact, he didn't take it seriously at all. He was always being rebellious and, and wandering off to places that he shouldn't have wandered off to. But there was a call on his life. And to make matters worse about this youngster is he really had a ratchet uncle with a disfigured face who was always looking for ways to usurp his father's organization. It was crazy. So one day, his uncle, of all people, set up a trap for the young boy and his father. You'll never believe what the trap was. It was a stampede of wildebeest. And so his father, in a latch effort to rescue his son, tosses his son up as his father is stamped, is trampeded upon and dies. And then his uncle says, you do, this is your fault. Like heaps shame on them. So he just runs out into the wilderness, into the wild, makes some new friends who are living the life of no worries. <laughs> Found himself not even thinking about his past. And then he stumbles into a girl he once knew back in the day. Ain't it always about a girl? <laughs> there it is again. Y'all see, it's always about a girl. This girl reminds him of who he truly is. And soon that young boy becomes a young adult and he decides, all right, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back home and I'm going to stake claim on my father's organization. And here comes the epic battle. There's always an epic battle. So they're fighting and they're scrapping and out of nowhere, the place just catches on fire. And then there's coals and the uncle takes the coals and throws it in the young man's eyes. He's like, ah, ah, ah. And you think it's all lost. He literally has him backed up into a cliff. You're like, this is over. The underdog is done. There's no comeback story for him. And as the uncle leaps, he goes over the cliff, down into the valley, and he is soon devoured by a pack of hyenas. Old homeboys who used to have his back are now devouring him. And this young man remembers his identity, takes his rightful place in his father's organization, and the circle of life continues. Y'all haven't heard of that one, have you? What's the name of that one? Lion the Lion King! We all love a good comeback story, right? Well, what if I told you that today we're going to look at the greatest comeback story of all time? A comeback story that beats all comeback stories. See, this comeback story is different than the other two that I told because this comeback story is actually true, 100% true. And although the battles are epic, and although the victory seems incomprehensible, it doesn't make it any less true. This story starts with a baby born in the little town of Bethlehem to a teenage girl named Mary who is impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit. This comeback story moves from the position of a baby growing into a boy, growing into a man. This young man finds himself going to the Jordan River to be baptized by a man named John the Baptist. 
And in that moment, the word says that the heavens opened up and a voice from heaven descended on him like a dove and said, this is my son for whom I am well pleased. It is in that moment that he begins his ministry as a young man. And can I tell you that the devil aimed to destroy him from the moment he was a baby to the moment that he became a boy to the moment where he was a man. Epic battles. But the enemy could not defeat him. After he began his public ministry, people came by the thousands to hear his teachings. His endless compassion for the people leads to multitudes being saved. Yet it was his passion for the people that actually led to his death. It was a Friday when they crucified him on a cross for a crime that he never committed. And this marked the beginning, the end of the beginning. The beginning of the greatest comeback there ever was. And we're going to look to the word of God to read about the greatest comeback there ever was. Church, did you bring your Bible today? So at RLC, we like to encourage everyone to bring the word of God with them. Whether you brought the old school leather bound. Anybody got a leather bound Bible? Go ahead and hold it up. Be proud. That's right. I see you, Miss Annette. Maybe you brought the digital version in your phone. That's okay. Go ahead and hold that up. All of them are powerful. And if you're so able, I like to give honor to the word of God before we read from it. Would do you mind joining me in just standing to your feet for a moment? Hold up your Bible because this is the power. Go ahead and pump, pump, pump it up. Say pump, pump, pump it up. Go ahead, pump it up. Oh, hey, have a seat. All right. The pa- there's power in the word of God. Somebody say, yeah, there is, Pastor. All right. We're going to start reading about this epic comeback, and you're going to find this in the book of Mark. That's what I'll be reading from today, the book of Mark. We're going to start in chapter 16, right at the top at verse 1. Mark 16, verse 1. And it says this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Solomon brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus Body. So pause here for a second. Here are three followers of Jesus, women, I might add, attending to the needs of the body of Jesus. Now, women back in that day were not seen as very valuable oftentimes, and yet they still had the courage, had the fortitude, despite the ridicule they would receive, to serve Jesus, not just in his life, but in his death. They still were serving Jesus in his death. See, all the world at this point had come to believe that Jesus was dead and gone. Dead and gone. Like there's, there's, there's no coming back from death from him. That's what the world was led to believe. Now, I want us to just put ourselves in the mindset of those women. I mean, surely they must have felt that pressure too. Surely they must have been overwhelmed by grief. I mean, they just witnessed their hero being brutally crucified on a cross. This hero, dead on a cross, where mere days ago, they believed him to be the savior of the world. And in their eyes, their savior was the one who turned out to be needing saved. So they're crushed, I'm sure. They're hurt, perhaps a little disoriented, devastated. Nevertheless, they remain faithful to serve him still. Moving on to verse 2, very early on that first day of the week, Sunday, say Sunday. Sunday. Just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, can I just share you th- this with you at the moment? Um, I'm a man who sometimes forgets details. Don't act like, hey, <laughs> wife ain't nobody talking to you right now. I'm a man who sometimes forgets details. Don't act like you're so saved that you never forget a detail. 
I just couldn't help but think of these three women. Like, like they're coming, they're grieving. They're like, yeah, we got the oil, we got the spices. We're going to go anoint my Jesus. Maybe they're singing some worship songs, believing like, oh, I'm grieving, I'm lamenting, I'm whatever. And, and I, I wonder at what point of the journey are they walking along like, okay, Martha, you got the spices. Yep, you got the oil check. Okay, when we get there, we're going to roll away a 2,000 pun bowl. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How are we going to do that? Little detail we didn't think about. And scholars say that this boulder that was in front of the tomb weighed anywhere from, anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. And these three women were going to lift it. But they forgot about that detail. So wife, when I forget and you give me a grocery store list and I forget the eggs, can you give me a little grace? They forgot that they had to roll away a tomb. <laughs> Fellas, can I say what, what? Yeah. Uh. All right. I digress. <laughs> Verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Say, phew! As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white and a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now, I think it's only natural that they might be a little alarmed, wouldn't you? I mean, they go to a tomb where death resides and expect to see a body that is dead, but instead they see a man dressed in white. And some gospel accounts, they, 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 uh, the other gospel accounts, they account for a, more than just one person. They're dressed in white. So, yeah, this would cause someone to be a little disoriented, yep, a little alarmed. They're trying to make sense of it all. Verse 6, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. Say, woo! woo! He's risen. Essentially, he's come back. He's not there. See the place where they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So, okay, so so much is being communicated in these last three verses of Scripture. And I'm going to take a moment. We're going we're gonna to park here for a second as I try to break some things down. I want to take a look at what I believe are three identifiable truths of what the resurrection of Christ means to us. And I call these our response to the comeback king. All right, based on these three verses. First point, point number one, don't be afraid. Say, don't be afraid. That's the first instruction they're given when they enter the tomb. Don't be alarmed. Essentially, don't be afraid. And I believe that this is actually instruction for all of us. Yeah. That we're actually not supposed to be afraid. Yeah. And maybe like the three women at the tomb, maybe you are walking around life feeling a little defeated and a little overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. Maybe you once had hope for something, hope for a better future, Better marriage, better career. You had a dream that you once believed in that you feel now was buried and in a tomb and has no, no ability to come back. Perhaps you just look at your life and the way that things turned out and you just feel empty and you feel so lost. Maybe you used to have hope, but if you're honest with yourself in this moment, you buried all your hope in a tomb. And you feel that there is no coming back. The hope that you once had is lost. Well, church, I believe that hope is not a concept. Hope is not a feeling. Hope is actually a person, and that person has a name, and it's Jesus Christ. And according to my Bible, hope never dies. Hope springs anew. Hope has risen. So I think there's a word in here for all of us, that when you find yourself in a place of your life where you've lost all hope, take your eyes off the thing that is discouraging you and put your eyes on Jesus because he is the source of all hope. And the Bible says, don't be afraid. Say that again. Don't be afraid. See, the thing about Jesus that I love about him is he can't be confined to a tomb. I love it. He's kind of stubborn like that. They're like, die, Jesus. He's like, nope, resurrection. He just can't do it. He refuses. See, Jesus knew what it felt like to be rejected. He knew 
what it felt like to be cast aside, overlooked, disregarded, publicly humiliated. The Bible says that they spit in his face. He knew what it felt like to be betrayed by his best friends in the world. For when you really wanted them to have your back, they didn't have it. He knew what it felt like to be ultimately given up, by, given up on by those that were considered the most religious, well-to-do, influential people in the world. He knew what it felt like for those people to say to him, you're not even worthy of life. Crucify him. My Jesus knew what it felt like to be lost. And yet he still commands us, don't be afraid. So let me remind you of the truth. The tomb is empty. Hope is not dead. In fact, hope has risen. So I need you to replace the lie of whatever you're, you might be telling yourself, whatever the enemy might be trying to whisper to you, whatever is going on that says that all hope is lost, I need you to replace it with the truth that hope is alive, hope has risen, and his name is Jesus, and he's here for you. Our second response to the comeback king. Number one was don't be afraid. Number two, don't live in the past. Acknowledge it and move on. We get this from Mark 16, verse 6. Listen to this. It says, see the place where they laid him. Acknowledge that he was crucified. See the place where they laid him. Not ignoring that hurt happened. Not ignoring that horrifying acts happened. But in the very next line it says, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. See, I believe that the word that is for me and that's for you and that's for all of us is, although death and destruction may have overcome us in the past, although we may have sinned, although we have made some mistakes, although we all have some regrets, we all have had a moment in the tomb. Let's just be real. Life happens. The struggle is real. But God is not asking you to pretend as if it never happened. He's saying, see the place where they laid him, but go. Move forward. Don't let that hold you back. Because in spite of our sin, in spite of our shortcomings, God still has a future ahead for you. But we got to get up and we got to keep it moving, y'all. We got to keep going. I get that we've all been through stuff. I get that we've all experienced pain. But we can either sit there and navel gaze about it and, and get in all up in our feelings about it. Or we can trust what God says and recognize that it was there. Let it inform us of where we once were. But let Jesus dictate where we are now going. We got to move on. We got to keep it moving. Say keep it moving. So you were divorced. Keep it moving. So you struggle with addiction. Keep it moving. So you're dealing with depression. Keep it moving. So you're unemployed. Keep it moving. So you're tired of being single. Keep it moving. So you're tired of being married. Keep it moving. So you're tired of life and you feel overwhelmed by everything. You feel like you can never get a break. Just when you get ahead, one step, something comes up in your life and knocks you 10 steps backwards. Guess what? You got to what? Ain't nobody going to break up my stride. Nobody going to hold me down. Oh, no. I got to keep on. You got to keep it moving. You got to keep it moving. Now, here's something that I believe will set you free. Regardless of how you feel about yourself or anyone else, regardless of how you feel that you deserve or don't deserve, regardless of whether you even think you're worthy of a second chance, a third chance, or a hundredth chance, it doesn't matter. Through the sacrificed blood of Jesus Christ, God has declared all who believe in him to be judged not guilty. With that ruling, we have all been given access to a comeback story. 
With that ruling, none of us will receive a, a fatal blow that will knock us out and keep us out. Not as long as we put our trust in Jesus who qualifies us. Yeah. Moving on to Mark 16, 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you. Now, I think this is interesting because perhaps you're in here and if you were anything like me, I thought, yeah, 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 pastor, that's all great. That's all good and dandy, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been. You don't know what I was doing just moments before I walked into the church doors. It's easy for you to say that I can keep it moving, but I, I, I can't keep it moving even to the next moment. My thoughts are so out of whack. Perhaps you're thinking that your sin is so special that it disqualifies you. Well, your sin ain't that special, first and foremost. And nothing can disqualify you from the love of God. Look, I'll prove it to you. I love this. In that verse 7 that I just read, it said, but go tell his disciples and Peter. Say, and Peter. and Peter. Why would he make a point to single out Peter? What is it about Peter that garnered such an honorable mention? Well, the scripture doesn't say specifically, but there are definitely some thoughts that, that I believe the Bible leads us to make some great, some great interpretations of why he would say, and Peter. I'm going to skip forward or skip back, excuse me, to Mark 14, verse 27. Listen to this. This is when Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So Jesus is telling all his best homies what's about to happen. Who pipes up first? Peter. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. <laughs> Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, Tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Say three times. Three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Hmm. This is Peter. This is the rock. Peter, the rock. Saint Peter. Peter. He's the one who... God is going to build his church from that Peter crushed under pressure. Even though he knew better. Jesus told him he would do it. He still had that in his head, had those thoughts of Jeter, those words of Jeter, Jesus ringing in his ear saying, you are going to die me three times. And he emphatically said, no, I won't. Guess what? He did. Yeah. Under the pressures of the world, I'm sure with the best intentions, with a great heart, but without the power of the Holy Spirit within his own strength, he just couldn't do it. St. Peter still betrayed Jesus. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt hearing the news that Jesus had arisen? Can you imagine being Peter in that moment? Feeling like a failure, feeling like a hypocrite. Feeling like I was the one who was, I was going to be the one. Even if I was going to be the only one, I was going to be the one. I was going to be the one. I was going to be there. And he wasn't. You see, but God knew what Peter didn't know. God knew that he was still going to use Peter to preach the very first message after Pentecost. And that in that message, thousands would be saved by the very man who felt he should be disqualified from that kind of blessing. God knew that Peter felt horrible. So what did he do? He said, go get, tell all the other disciples and Peter. Because the fact of the matter is probably when you go to call out Peter, he's going to be the one that says, no, no, I know you're not talking to me because you don't understand what I did. You don't understand the sin. You don't understand the level of betrayal. You don't understand. I, I was the one who professed that I love God. I, I was the one who had the perfect Christian walk, and then I fell. I was the one who said I would, I, would, I would never fall into addiction, and I failed. I was the one who said I would never get pregnant outside of marriage, and I failed. I was the one who said I would always live my life uprightly, and I was the first one to sell out as soon as the pressure came down under me. There's no way God could love me. Pastor, say what you want. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. God's love just isn't that great. God's love just isn't that grand. Well, guess what? Yes, it is. He loves you as far as the east is to the west. And he's calling back to you say, yeah, go tell everyone about me and you. 
because I gave up my life for you. Peter would eventually lead a worldwide movement called Christianity. And I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's still going strong today. Just look around. So how do we respond to the comeback king? Number one, don't be afraid. Number two, don't live in the past. Acknowledge it and move on. And number three, my third and final point, don't stop believing. Verse 7, Mark, Mark 16, verse 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Many of us, God has already told us what he's going to do. God has already told us where he's going to be. He's where he said he was going to be. He's just waiting for you to show up. Oftentimes people say, where is God gone? I'm like, God ain't gone nowhere. Where did you go? Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. See, Jesus told his disciples that he would be crucified to a cross on a Friday. And in a moment of distress, that's all they were consumed with, is the fact that he was crucified on a cross. Jesus told his disciples that he would be crucified to a cross on a Friday. But he also said on the third day, Sunday, he would rise again. Church, I think we can get so lost in the death of Friday that we forget that Resurrection Sunday is coming. I think that we can get so lost in the death of Friday that we forget that resurrection is coming on Sunday. It's been promised. He said, I will be there. See, with Jesus, a comeback story is always possible. With Jesus, your comeback story is always possible. See, the scriptures tells us that Jesus did not disappear. That his, he, he continued to appear to his disciples and to many throughout Galilee just as he promised. Don't stop believing. Mark 16, 15 through 16 says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And as his disciples went out and began to preach, the word of God says it was followed by multitudes of signs and wonders. Verse 19, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Now, wasn't that the greatest comeback story there ever was? Yes. Here's what makes it even greater. He's made that same power, that same ability to come back available to all of us. We all have access to a comeback story. You don't have to take my word for it. I'm going to have you take a word from a couple of my friends who I've invited up to share theirs. My name is Mona Moore, and this is my comeback story. In February of 2016, at 14 years old, I began to attend RLC, and my faith was on fire. I found something to believe in and something to live for. God now held a significance in my life and in an authority I had never before given him. In January of 2018, I stood on this platform at 16 years old and gave my testimony on the impact God had on my life at the time and how thankful I was to be surrounded by so many amazing people here that I call family. Today, I stand on this exact platform, 18 years old, with a new testimony, a comeback story. Mm -hmm. To be completely honest with you all, 2018 was one of the worst years of my life. In the short amount of time I have been on this earth, I have seen some pretty bad years the only difference this time was that I was walking with God, but still suffering. This was where the birth of doubt began. 
I had lost two of my closest friends, my only friends, due to their intolerance of who I was as a person. In all, they left me because I was me. This was heartbreaking because I had trusted these two girls with my secrets, my insecurities, and my downfalls. This loss was where the enemy told me there was something wrong with me, and I believed him. This triggered something I had been struggling with but never wanted to tell a soul about, my eating disorder. It was something I had battled since I was 10 years old. At that time, I was bullied every single day for how I looked, talked, and laughed. This caused me to isolate myself, and the only comfort I had was found in the very thing causing my pain, food. Here I was, seven years later, repeating the same cycle, putting my worth and comfort in the world when I knew better, but still fell victim to the lies of the enemy. As I was faced with emotional and mental pain, I now hated everything, including myself. I hated my body and the way it looked. I hated how quiet I was and how I allowed for people to take advantage of me and my smarts. I hated how the only reason I was of any value to someone was because of my grades or the fact that I could score high on tests. I hated who I was. God, why did you have to make me this way? Why couldn't I have been different? Why couldn't I be like the other girls? I no longer saw value in who I was. My test scores weren't high enough. My GPA wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough. Who was I to think I'd get accepted into a fancy school? Who was I to think things would ever go my way? The enemy began to steal my happiness and my love for God. I stopped reading my Bible and I stopped worshiping. I refused. I was now on the fence about a God whom I had given my life to. I felt like a fraud for still serving and putting up this faithful front in public when I was denying him in private. But you see, the enemy may have thought he had power over me, but he is no match for who my God is. Yeah. I had had enough and I said no more. God said no more. Devil, you can't have me or my soul. You can't have my mind, my peace, or my future. I stand here 18 years old and so much more in love with God than ever before. My, my faith has been restored and the blessings have come. I seek nothing more now than to serve him and live my life out loud for him. He again has given me something to live for. Those test scores and endless hours of studying the enemy told me weren't enough, granted me a scholarship to my number one choice school, Vanguard University. If it hadn't been for my faith in my studies in God, I would have given up and let the devil win. But look at God. My faith has also led me to an amazing opportunity this summer to go to Uganda with my oldest sister, Sammy, through RLC's partnership with Reach Up Reach Out Ministries, a faith-based nonprofit organization that serves the needs of orphans and widows who have been devastated by the AIDS pandemic. Look at God. Come on. And that girl who used to cry, When she looked in the mirror, the girl who hated to be seen or to even exist, I now stand here knowing that I am strong and I am beautiful. Yeah. 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 I am worthy and I am seen. I stand here feeling the chains of bondage over my mind and my heart dissipating, for God is here. And where there is light, the dark must disappear. What once was is no longer for, and I said it last time, so I'll say it again. No one can take from me what God has destined to be. For Psalm 3.3 says, But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. This is only the beginning, and the best is yet to come. <laughs> My name is James, and this is my comeback story. 
For the last 28 years of my life, God has been trying to get my full attention so that we as a team can piece back together the puzzle that the enemy, the puzzle of my life that the enemy has scattered. 28 years ago, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. <sighs> the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy in my life, as it says in John 10.10. 10. I was just 10 years old, and someone in the circle of trust sexually abused me. This abuse wasn't a one-time thing, but in fact, continued on for several years. Before that event took place, I was the popular and confident kid. Two years later, I began to understand what was happening to me and what was actually still happening to me, and the guilt, shame, anxiety, and depression kicked in. As a result, I became the kid in junior high that walked around with his head down and had a huge struggle with confidence. I struggled to look people in the eyes as I now believe that if, if people knew the disgustingness that had happened to me and was in fact still happening to me, they would treat me as a leper. The lack of confidence and social awkwardness made me appear weird to others and thus I was a scrawny kid that got bullied and made, that made matters even worse. In junior high, I began to medicate my pain by acting out sexually with others, the very thing that caused me pain in the first place. I accepted Jesus as my savior at the age of 17, but I didn't give it all to Jesus. Rather, I just accepted his gift of salvation and continued to medicate my hurtful past through inappropriate sexual relationships. It was my way of saying, Jesus, I give you this hand, but I'm gonna keep this hand behind my back, this hand of hurt and pain that I've gone through. I'm gonna keep it behind my back. I can't give that to you. I can't let you know about that. Wow. Finally, at the age of 30, I was able to attend a celebrate recovery at my local church. Yeah. In the very first meeting, I was able to share the fullness of my hurtful past with others and tears poured down my face and soaked the ground beneath me. That was my big step in giving my other hand to Jesus and now making him the Lord of my life. Yeah. Fast forward to summer, winter 2018. I attended Celebrate Recovery Step Study here at Redeem Life Church where the Lord did even more healing in me and we began to piece together the wounds of my past. We began to heal the wounds of my past. Now I'm consistently attending Celebrate Recovery on Thursday nights here at the church and the Lord has been continuing to heal me and give me strength. The Lord has been continuing to heal me and give me strength as I press into him and bring amazing brothers around me to keep me strong in my sexual integrity. My time in prayer and in the word has grown by leaps and bounds in 2019. The puzzle of my life that the Lord and I are piecing back together represents the strong warrior for Christ that God has called me to be. Come on. The God-fearing husband that God has called me to be. Yeah. The leader and the future pastor that God has called me Say to be. Say that. That puzzle is just pieces away from being complete as I continue to press into God and be obedient to him. I conclude with the full scripture of John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God comes to bring abundant life. Yeah. This is my comeback story. Thank you, Jesus. Come on! My name is Charlize, and this is my comeback story. Uh, growing up, I never thought much about not having a dad. Because my father had served in the military, my family received benefits after he passed away. This really helped build my worldview of a father. Mostly it was someone who took care of their kids. Being raised in a Christian home, I knew that God was my dad. When times were tough, I would call on my Heavenly Father, and He would display His faithfulness time and time again. I think that the biggest thing I was missing in my life was that although God provided for all of my needs, I never understood His love for me. I don't have memories of an earthly father who picked me up when I was down, or who hugged me when I was unlovable, or who told me they were proud of me when I was behaving ugly. I'm sure my dad did all those things in the few years of my life that he was alive, but to be honest, the strongest memory that always flashes back is one where my dad misunderstood a horrible situation 
and was upset with me for something I had no control over. My dad died not too long after that. I felt so ashamed and guilty and subconsciously carried that shame from childhood onward. Now, not to toot my own horn too loudly, <laughs> but I excelled at most things I pursued in life, academic, sports, music, whatever. I was congratulated for a lot of achievements, and I think that the approval of others became my replacement for my father's love. I was a perfectionist. It mattered to me what people thought. One of the most distinct memories of my life was realizing that whenever I felt threatened, I could use my sense of humor to get people to like me and give me validation. In the sea of life, I was good. I found an awesome husband. I went much further in my career than many of my classmates, and I served diligently in a really impressive church. I was a representative of Christ, an example of God's faithfulness. I was doing big things in Jesus' name. But really, I was just keeping afloat. I was paddling as hard as I could, but low self-esteem, zero self-worth, and frankly, self-centeredness had attached their anchors, and I was sinking fast. Suicidal thoughts were always at the forefront of my mind, as they had been periodically for most of my life. In the past, the thought of going to hell was what kept me from giving in, but it was getting harder and harder to stay above water. I reached for whatever debris could keep my head above water. Alcohol, overspending, overserving, more achievements, but my sense of worthlessness was too heavy. I got to the point where I didn't think hell could be worse than the misery of my life. I had a plan to say goodbye, but in the nick of time, I attended a Celebrate Recovery, which is where my comeback began. God taught me so much when I was at my lowest, including yeah. what a father's love actually meant. I discovered that God took care of me not because he was obligated as a dad, but he took care of me because he loved me. I didn't need to impress him. I didn't need to make him laugh. Hmm. I, I probably did that. Um, <laughs> none of my shameful behavior in life mattered. He was there to pick me up and hug me when I was at my lowest. God's grace was more than sufficient. All I needed to do was surrender. 1 John 9.10 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. My comeback includes a healthy marriage and a beautiful son. I gained a whole squad of healthy friends and have had the unbelievable honor of helping others when they were sinking. He broke the chains that were pulling me down and became the ship that carries me through the sea of life. It turns out that I still am a representative of Christ, but one filled with gratitude and the love of a good, good father. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Fierro, and this is my comeback story. Thank you. Since I was the age of 12, woo, Come on. I, uh, since I was the age of 12, I abused alcohol. And uh, by the time I was 18, I was experiencing blackouts. And by the age of 21, I was in rehab. Due to the cycle of my insanity, I would be in rehab three more times. My addictive nature led me to abuse street drugs and then eventually leading to a seven year period where I abused prescription drugs, methamphetamines, and painkillers. At the height of my addiction, I was self medicating with 50 Vicodin a day. And um, over a period, a period of 21 years, my life was out of control and reckless. I didn't care about anyone but myself. I was arrested seven times. I was convicted of two felonies, two misdemeanors, and three DUIs. I had become the worst version of myself, and I had lost my identity. I had become a liar, a thief, an addict, and a convicted felon. My whole world was collapsing. I lost cars, I lost my career, I lost where I lived, I lost where I grew up. I lost friends. I was losing the people that mattered the most to me and losing my health at the same time. Yet there's nothing worse than losing your identity. Nothing leaves you more helpless than that. I had never faced anything so hard that it pushed me to the absolute, the absolute breaking point. And I felt entirely powerless. But Jesus loves me. 
Yes, he does. For his power is made perfect in my weakness. And despite everything I had done, when I finally surrendered to King Jesus, he said, come on, son, you're not done yet. You have a comeback story to tell. Remember this, remember this. You can't rise like a lion unless you first kneel like a lamb. That's it, that's it. Since completely turning my life over to Jesus, I was released from jail. I got baptized. I began serving in church. I got my driver's license back. I, got, I was given a car. I got a job working at church. I got, a, I got a second job with two of my best friends. I got all my felonies expunged and I got the fire of the Holy Spirit. Yeah! What took more than two decades to lose, Jesus restored in three years. Wow. And guess what? There's still more. A few months ago, I got married to Amanda. <laughs> And now, today, I have four years of sobriety. Yeah. Every day, every day I kneel in prayer and I admit my weaknesses so that I can enter into Christ's strength. And if I listen, if I listen, I hear God saying, you're the son of a king. Yeah. You are the light of the world. And you are as bold as a lion. Church, Jesus loves me. Yeah. He saved me from three DUI accidents and three drug overdoses. But most importantly, he saved me from my own prison and from the lies of the enemy. When the enemy would say that I'm a felon and that I'll never be able to get a real job, God said I'm his beloved son and now I work for Jesus. And the enemy said that I'll always be alone and no one, that no one would ever trust me. Jesus said, I'll give you the wife that you always dreamed of and an entire church that has your back. Come on! Come on! Satan, Satan, if you're listening, I have a message for you. Yesterday, I thought my identity was lost. But today, I step into the truth about who I am. Six times, you try to take my life. And six times, Jesus has saved me. Yeah. But he's given me a seventh chance. And this time, this time, I'm seeking to give a gift and not receive one. I'm no longer here trying to impress people. But I am sent by God to bless people. Come on! This is who I am. This is my identity. This is my comeback story. Yeah! And guess what? Jesus has a comeback story for you. I don't know how you walked in here. I don't know what you've gone through, but I can tell you this, that the same mighty God that rescued all these people, the same mighty God that spoke into all these lives is the same mighty God that is in this place right now and that is calling you. You're not down. You're not out. It's not over. God wants to give you the greatest comeback story that you've ever experienced. If it's unforgiveness, it's okay to come back. If you feel like depression has robbed you, it's okay to come back. If you feel like addiction has stolen your identity, God's got a new identity for you, and it's loved and redeemed in Christ. Whatever it is, whatever you may be facing today, God loves you, and he's ready to pull you through it. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are here today. I thank you for your son Jesus who died on a cross. I thank you that Jesus, you refused to stay dead. You said, I will rise. And it was through the risen Savior, through the blood of Jesus, that we get to experience new life in you. 
But perhaps you're in this room and you're hearing us talk about this Jesus, this Savior, and if you're being honest with yourself, you don't know him. Maybe you've heard about him, but you've never made a choice to choose him. Well, today I want to give you that choice. In just a moment, I'm going to say a prayer out loud, and I'm going to invite everybody in this place, every single voice in this place, to repeat that prayer after me. And in that prayer, we're going to choose God. Now, maybe you're in here, and you'll be choosing God for the first time. Before I count to three and we pray that prayer, I just want to know who you are. So I'm going to count to three. And if you're in this place and you've never received Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior, if you're in this place and you know that the Spirit of God is calling you, if you're in this place and perhaps you've been to church a million times, or perhaps this is the first time you've ever been in church, but you've never made a choice to choose God and to let Him be the Savior and the Lord of your life, right now I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to put your hand in the air. Here's all that's going to happen. When you put your hand in the air, I'm going to make eye contact with you, and then you're going to put your hand right back down. That's it, and then we're all going to pray this prayer together. But this is your opportunity to choose Jesus, just as he chose you, just as he spread his arms on a cross for you, just as he expresses his love for you in this moment. The whole reason you're here is for this moment. The whole reason you've been brought into this church is for this moment. Now is your opportunity to say, Jesus, I choose you on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Go ahead and put your hand in the air. Go and put your hand. Put it way high. Way high. I see that. I see one. I see two. I see three. I see four. I see five. I see six. I see seven. I see you, sir. Praise God. Praise God. Keep the clapping going. There's more. I see seven. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Praise God. Praise God. Whoa! Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. I want everybody in this place to say this prayer out loud. Repeat after me. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. I believe he is the son of God, that he died on a cross for me, that he defeated death for me, and that he's raised to heaven for me. Jesus, come into my life. Make me new. I declare from this day forward, I choose you. I serve you. I love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, church. Celebrate up in this place. Come on, God. Come on, God. Praise you, 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 God. All right, I want everybody to follow me for a moment in that seat back in front of you. My wife talked about it earlier. There was a connect card. If you have that connect card, will you go ahead and pull that out? In fact, everyone can go ahead and pull that out. Maybe you started writing down 